right, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That was well done, well done. I want to give an introduction to our speaker tonight, Randy Maxwell. I'm going to ask Randy to come on up here if he doesn't mind uh, coming up next to uh, his president. N new one because he's new to the conference. Right. And uh, we're very glad. I tell you what, when uh, I saw his name um, uh, on here tonight, I said, oh man, this is so great. He's not just guest speaking, he's actually part of our conference. I said, this is pretty awesome, you know. And uh, Randy, we're real glad and pleased and happy that you. you're here. Do you know what Randy's uh, favorite color is? Blue. <laughs> so you didn't know that, did you? I didn't either. I asked him, tell me some things about yourself that people don't know. And uh, so he, wrote, he gave me a few things. He's got uh, three children, uh, Candy. He's married to Jesse with two grand. Now he's got two grand. They have two children, his grandchildren, Jaden and Sydney, boy and girl. That's right. And uh, Crystal and Danielle. I did ask him what their ages were, but he wasn't ready to give me that much information yet, okay? <laughs> I just, uh, not his daughters, okay? Not his daughters. <laughs> Um, I, you know, one of his favorite things to do is, is road, bike, bicycling, road cycling, and golfing. I'm okay with the cycling, the golfing, I've just never picked up yet. I said, I'm not very good at that at all. Um, he uh, likes uh, Star Trek, not Star Wars. Okay. There's a difference. There is a major difference there. That's right. He's a graduate of Linwood Academy in Southern California. And he does have a new book coming out in September. And uh, I've been blessed by his uh, other books. I know you will too, uh, by this new one, this uh, Boot Camp for the Last Days. Tell us just one real 30 seconds what this book is going to be all about, your new one, okay? It's a relational look at the three angels' messages. We revisit those um, special messages and look at especially how they inform our relationship with God okay. in the last days. How are we supposed to relate to God? How are we supposed to walk with him in light of these messages that are given to the world? Okay. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I've already bought it. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Randy is going to be our speaker here tonight. I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say. I invite you to come with an open heart, open mind, and open ears as the Holy Spirit teaches us tonight through Randy. Let's pray together. And Randy, let me pray with you. Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege it is to be here in this house of prayer tonight. This is your house. Yes. This is holy ground. Mm -hmm. You have consecrated it unto yourself. We have prayed over these grounds. This is holy ground. And now this is holy time. And we ask, Father, for you to bless your servant. Just anoint him, I pray, with your Holy Spirit. Give him, Lord, your thoughts your message for tonight that we need to hear. Pour out your spirit on this congregation. We are needy and yes, we are Lord. thirsting mm. for more of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Reveal your word to us, Lord, tonight. Make it very, very clear that our hearts might be moved and we might be melted and molded a little bit more into the image of the one that we love so much. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, it is on you that we stand tonight as our only hope. Everything else around us is sinking sand. Lord, you are our rock and our fortress, our strong tower. We are only safe as we run to you. And so we pray that in this, this sacred hour when we come together, Lord, that you will be our defense and our strength. Send your Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, let that word change us and make us new. And we pray this in the worthy and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I was almost, I almost said happy Sabbath. <laughs> that 
that, that usually is what comes next. <laughs> but uh, good evening, and I'm glad that you are here um, with us today. It is um, an honor to stand here, um, not as a guest speaker, but as a member of the, Rent, the, the Renton Church family, yes, as well as the Washington Conference. My wife and I figured it out. The last time we were here was in 2006. Ten years ago, I had just begun um, our journey as a pastoral couple in Cuna, Idaho. And we were embarking on a new journey then, and we were here for a camp meeting, and we got to share a little bit of the Word of God, and we can just imagine the fact that God must have been smiling then, knowing that 10 years later, we'd be back, but this time to stay. And so it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you. And um, Seth Pierce has been blessing us the last couple of nights. He's been talking about being invited from the kids' table to the adults' table. And I, I feel like in my assignment over in guest services um, that I probably should have been sent back to the kids' table a long time ago. <laughs> I, I will say to you folks that you have been extremely gracious and patient with me as the new guy has struggled to learn the, the new software program and to learn the campus and find out where the RVs are and where the conference tents are and the U-pitch tents are and the dry RVs are and where Whitson Hall is and Grace Hall and uh, for people who want you know, two tents and then a room or they want an RV space and then a dry space and, a, and, and, and then a U-pitch tent and then, oh, by the way, we're going to bring in some family members and we need a couple of conference tents and could we have an extra floor with that because we only have half a floor, but my tent's leaning against a tree. Can we move to this look? Um, and... And all along, um, the computers are um, slow and, and crashing, and I'm hitting the wrong buttons and um, feeling um, very small. But um, to your credit, thank you for your patience. You have been very kind, and it has been a, an overall uh, very positive experience for my wife and I uh, here this year. I don't have a PowerPoint for you uh, tonight, um, so we're going uh, low-tech. Is that all right? It's, it's not that I'm opposed to it. Uh, my members in written know that I use PowerPoint. Uh, I just, you know, between uh, the class that I do with Kevin Wilfley in the afternoon and uh, uh, guest services, I just didn't have time to get it done. So we're going to do it the old-fashioned way and use the PowerPoint of our mind and see images inside of our mind and use the Word of God and turn the pages, actually. Uh, if you can, you can still look it up on your cell phone as well. What you don't know can hurt you. What you receive as a gift and waste will haunt you. And... Wasted talent, wasted opportunity, wasted time, it was all such a waste. Now, if you've been under a rock and haven't been among the millions who have viewed the viral video, it's still out there for all to see. The camera is inside of a car that is exiting a freeway, giving us the driver's view through the front windshield. As the vehicle approaches an intersection at the end of the off-ramp, the driver can be heard saying, there are often homeless people asking for change at freeway exit ramps, but recently there's been this guy with an interesting sign at I-71 and Hudson Street. 
His handwritten sign says that he has the God-given gift of a great voice. As the camera rolls, the figure of a man standing on a grassy median comes into view. The car rolls to a stop, and there he is, a slender man with wild hair, wearing a camouflage jacket, and gripping a cardboard sign that says, I have a God-given gift of voice. I'm an ex-radio announcer who has fallen on hard times. Please, any help will be gratefully appreciated. Thank you, and God bless you. Happy holidays. What the camera doesn't see and what the driver doesn't know yet was the last 20 years of misery leading up to this divine appointment that would forever change Ted Williams' life. After living in condemned buildings, eating pizza off the ground, and giving every cent he had he could get his hands on to crack, he became what he despised for 20 years, a panhandler. For one hour every day, regardless of the weather, there the man with the golden voice stood with his sign. He had endured insults and expletives yelled at him from passers-by in their cars, objects thrown at his head, and even his own grown children ignoring him as they drove past their loathsome father. Hey, I'm going to make you work for your dollar, says the car's driver. Say something with that great radio voice. The man holding the sign doesn't hesitate. In the warm, voluminous tone of a bass saxophone, he croons, When you're listening to nothing but the best of oldies, you're listening to Magic 98.9. He takes a step back from the car window with a wide smile that betrays his plight and says, thank you so much, God bless you. Then he steps forward and issues another blast from the instrument in his throat. And we'll be right back after these words. Within hours of that now infamous video hitting the internet, Ted Williams went from his begging corner in Ohio to Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, New York, using his golden voice to open the Today Show with Matt Lauer and Meredith Vieira. Many of you saw that. About now, your, your mind must be shouting the question, how does someone with a million dollar gift end up carrying his clothes in a plastic bag? How does someone with such a God-given talent wind up eating out of garbage cans and selling his son's baby clothes for drugs? How does someone who has been given so much end up with so little? Well, don't ask it of Mr. Williams tonight if you're not willing to ask it of yourself. It's like, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not homeless. I'm not panhandling. If what I say next offends you, pray for me, but there are times when the church in America bears a striking resemblance to this once homeless man begging for change and holding a sign on the side of the road. Because just like Mr. Williams lived as a beggar while possessing a golden voice, too many Christians are living as spiritual panhandlers while possessing the priceless treasure of the living Christ. It's as if the church is standing at the crossroads of life holding a sign that says, I have the God-given gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm the body of Christ who has fallen on hard times. Please, any help will be appreciated. I have no power, but I've got great coffee in the lobby and good praise music. Thank you and God bless you. 
As a pastor, I stand in the pulpit week after week and I, I look into the faces of people I love and pray for and I get comfort from those who love and pray for me and my wife. But increasingly, the ones who worship and sing and attend small group and know John 3.16 and give tithes and offerings are carrying signs with them into church. Not cardboard signs, but ones that can be easily read in their tired eyes, tight faces, and slumped shoulders. They say overwhelmed, exhausted, stressed out, discouraged, depressed. Somehow, our faith system isn't keeping us out of the emotional gutter, and there are rags where there should be riches. We find ourselves spiritually holding a sign by the roadway instead of reigning with Christ in the heavenlies. And what's been bothering me lately is that it seems to be the new normal for many. Discouragement and defeat have become the default setting on our lives and not the exception for the times of distress that we all go through. Do we know who we are in Christ? Do we not still possess the pearl of great price? Have we buried the treasure of the Holy Spirit in the ground with nothing to show the Master for his investment of the life, death, and resurrection of his dear Son on our behalf? Hosea recorded God's heart cry over Israel. My people, he wrote, are being destroyed because they don't know me. King James Version says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but that knowledge is about me. 20 plus centuries later and God's people are still defeated and destroyed because of a lack of knowledge, not a lack of information about God. How could that be? Like Pastor Seth has been reminding us, we've got Google. And Google's got us. The adopted son of Mr. and Mrs. Williams from Brooklyn, New York, had fallen onto hard times while possessing a great gift, a golden voice that was worth millions. You and I, the adopted sons and daughters of the king of the universe, have fallen onto hard times while possessing the greatest gift of all, the Holy Spirit who brings us Christ himself. Someone once said to Ted Williams, you've got talent, man. What are you doing on the street? God is saying to his church, you've got Jesus, man. All things are yours. The world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. What are you doing here? Why are you holding that sign? But the man with the golden voice experienced a revival even before he was discovered on the I-71 off-ramp. He knew who he was and he heard God calling him to come home even when he was at his lowest smoking kitty litter off the floor, living in the woods with a bucket for a toilet and breaking his girlfriend's arm in three places. He would phone home and his mother would always say, you got a home, Teddy. You can always come home. You're still my little boy. And I believe the church with the golden promise of Christ abiding with us always, the church that possesses the unsearchable riches of Christ will experience a revival also. No matter how far we've lived beneath our privileges as God's sons and daughters, if we will phone home in prayer, our father will always say, you got a home child. You can always come home. You're still my child. That's hope. That's wholeness. Coming home. Reclaiming our rightful place at the table and discovering our true identity in Christ. 
And I believe those two words are the answer to our spiritual panhandling, to our abject spiritual poverty, who we are and what we've been given in Christ. It's like that buried stash of golden coins a California couple stumbled upon in their own backyard as they walked their dog one evening. They noticed the, the top of a decaying canister poking out of the ground. They thought it was a tree root. They dug it out with a stick. They took it to their house and opened it up and inside was what looked like a, a, a batch of, of discs covered in dirt from holes rotted through the can. Those discs turned out to be nearly perfectly preserved $20 gold coins with Liberty Head designs on the front dated from the 1890s. More digging produced about eight more cans containing more than 1,400 coins with a value of more than $10 million. It was the largest discovery in the state of California. Now imagine sitting on top of a gold mine and not knowing it. But that's us. We're rich beyond all measure and don't know it. My people are being destroyed because they don't know. They don't know. I believe our buried treasure is found in the tiny New Testament letter from Paul to the Colossians. We've possessed it all along, but just haven't understood its worth. I know I haven't. It may look like just batches of discs covered in dirt at first, so don't be too quick to judge by appearances. Colossians 1 verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there it is. Our mother load, the secret of the mystery of godliness, not us trying to be like Christ but the resurrected Christ himself alive in us. His presence and not our performance is our only hope of glory. Without this hope, we will continue holding our signs guilty of trying to be Christians without being like Christ. That's an oxymoron. being Christians without being like Christ. Is that even possible? Is it possible to believe the right things? To even do some of the right things? To eat the right things? To wear the right things and still not be like Christ? Is that possible? Well, ask the Pharisees. Ask Gandhi, who said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Ask the five foolish virgins. Now think about this. They were virgins. And you know, when you're doing a Bible prophecy, you know that women in the scriptures, especially in the prophetic books, tend to represent churches. And you know in Revelation we have what? We have a pure woman dressed in white, right? She represents the, the true church of God. And we know the 144,000, those are they who have not defiled themselves with women, right? Virgins, virtuous, as opposed to the harlot woman. So these are virgins, which means they possess pure doctrine. These are not false women. They do not teach heresy. They possess pure doctrines. They are undefiled. All of them are waiting for the bridegroom. All had wedding garments. All had lamps. All had oil, by the way. 
They all possessed oil, all slept, and all revived. But not all were prepared to meet the bridegroom. Why not? We know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. His character. So it's clear that what the foolish virgins lacked was the character of Christ. Somehow they missed that. And that's the reason why later the bridegroom, when they come to the door, says, Depart from me, I, I, I don't know who you are. Why does he say that? Because he doesn't see the family resemblance. He doesn't see the family resemblance. They were unprepared because they thought being invited to the party was enough. That having the Bible and believing the right doctrine was enough. They forgot you must be born again. I think I can say with some degree of certainty tonight that what's missing in Christianity is Christ. Not the preaching of Christ, but the living Christ himself manifesting the love of God in us. It's not information that's lacking, but transformation. And this is so basic to Christianity. I'm almost embarrassed to have to bring it up in a group of Christ followers who have studied so much and heard so many sermons and been to so many camp meetings and attended church for so many years. I mean, we're sophisticated Bible students. It's, it's, like, a, it's like in a physics class going back to one plus one equals two. It's so basic to Christianity. And yet somewhere amidst our charts and our graphs and our Vatican watches and culture wars and all the rest, we forgot the words of Jesus to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verses 5 and 7. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. You must be born again. Folks, that means you can't take your sinful nature to heaven with you. Can't do it. Some of us take the song, Just As I Am, a little too far. It's true, we come to Christ and he accepts us just as we are with all of our baggage and scars. It's true, but we don't stay that way. The Spirit of Christ comes in and he makes us just like Jesus. That's the hope of glory. We come just as we are, but the goal of redemption is to make us just as he is. It's not just to give us a job, but to get us off the street. Anything less is foolishness, a lamp without oil, a form of godliness without the power. Jesus reminded Nicodemus, John chapter 3, 14 and 15, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus must be lifted up in your life, in your attitude, in your decisions, in how you treat people, even those you disagree with. Jesus must be lifted up 
If it's still you being lifted up instead of Jesus, your temper, your lust, your hatred, your prejudice, then it doesn't matter what you know about the sanctuary, the Sabbath, or the Pope. You must be born again. You've got to start over. It's a reboot. Just like this morning when I was trying to register my first renewal in Whitson, I started out the reservation the wrong way. I, I, I came in the wrong way. You know, Jesus says, I am the door. Anybody else trying to get in as a thief and a robber? Well, I, I tried to come in the wrong way. And I got fouled up. I got lost in the computer. I couldn't get out. I got all the way to the payment screen and I, I couldn't charge the lady because it, the way I did it, it made it seem like a credit, like she had already paid for it. I knew that wasn't right. There were, you know, it seemed like about 30 or 40 people in line stacked up. I was starting to sweat. And finally, I just said, you know what, I, 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 can't, I can't go any further. I, I think we just need to start over. Can I turn it off and <laughs> start again? That's how it is with our lives. You've got to be born again. You need to reboot. Christianity is not about a modification of your old self. It is a death and resurrection. We don't come in. Jesus doesn't come in and do some minor decorating. He doesn't just slap some paint on the outside, put up some new wallpaper, even bring in some new furniture. No, it's demo day. He takes you down to the foundation. And then he builds something new. You must be born again in the fall of 1930. A little lady by the name of Miss Marie Monson, a Norwegian, a Norwegian evangelical Lutheran missionary, helped spark a revival in China through prayer and simply asking people one question Have you been born again? The Chinese mission at that time was extremely depressed. It was reported at the time that some 60 churches had either died or were dying. The missionaries were discouraged. The evangelists would come and they would try to hold meetings and they would leave discouraged. Uh, no one was coming to Christ and uh, uh, the members of the churches themselves seemed in a, in a spiritual stupor, a spiritual depression. And it was in that environment that this little Norwegian lady came. They say she was a quiet speaker, not dynamic at all, diminutive in size. <laughs> But she depended upon the promises of God in a remarkable way and most especially upon the promise given in the Gospel of John 16 verse 8. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He himself, the Holy Spirit, would convict of sin. And Miss Monson uh, did not filter who she asked the question to. The question was asked of preacher, evangelist, mission president, missionary, and Bible teacher alike. And often her question was met with resentment. What do you mean, am I born again? I'm the missionary teacher here at this school. I'm the, I'm the president of this mission. I'm the, I'm the pastor of this church. What do you mean, am I born again? But she, would, she was unmovable. Have you been born again? 
The Spirit used that simple question, those simple words like a two-edged sword to pierce through the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And here was the real reason for the dead churches. The dry experience among the workers and the sense of hopelessness. It was unconfessed sin. And as the, the people began to process through the question, well, what did she mean by that? Have I been born again? It produced a brokenness. And there was weeping and there was confession that would break out and, and there Miss Monson would be at the end of every Bible class asking the people as they came out, have you been born again? Confessions came, then it spread to family members and then friends and then ultimately as people bore testimony to what God was doing in their lives and being set free and receiving a fresh infilling of the Spirit like never before, it spread to the community. And thousands unearthed the treasure of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was written during that time, it's easy to win the lost when Christ's spirit has free, clean channels through which to work. How does it happen? Not by trying, but by trusting. Jesus comes in by permission. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He comes in by permission. See, there's two parts of this thing. There's being in Christ. And is Christ in you? Being in Christ, of course, is, a, is, a, is an act of faith. We, we accept by faith that uh, we were in Christ when he was on the cross. That he took our sins to hell for us, right? We died with him. We rose with him. And we are seated together with him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, right? We receive that by faith. We are in Christ. We are in him. But then there's another part which is Christ in me. And I've got to open the door to let that happen. I've got to hear Christ knocking and say, come on in. And when I say come on in, I don't say come on in as a guest. I'm inviting him to live. I'm inviting him to do whatever Rearranging needs to be done. Christ in me, the hope of glory. How does it happen? Jesus comes in by permission and it's time to let him in. Christ in me is my hope of glory. It's time to get out of the food line of scarcity so that we can start feasting at the banquet table of God. If we're hungry, it's not because God hasn't provided the bread of life. If we're thirsty, it's not because God hasn't provided the water of life. If we're naked, it's not because God hasn't given us the robe of his righteousness. If we're blind, it's not because God has withheld the heavenly eye salve. If we're poor in spirit, it isn't because God hasn't given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. If we're lonely, it's not because God hasn't sent us the comforter to be with us and in us forever. If we're walking in darkness, it's not because God hasn't given us the light of the world. If we're living in defeat, it's not because God hasn't made us more than conquerors in Christ. God has given us everything we need, Peter says, for life and godliness. It's time we started living like it. I want to pray the same prayer for you and me that Paul offered on behalf of the Ephesians. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Thank <laughs> you.
I want God to open our eyes to, so that we can see who we really are. Several years ago, you remember Elizabeth Smart, the young girl who was kidnapped in the dead of night from her bed by a deranged man who fancied himself a prophet who was deluded into believing that when he saw Elizabeth with her family in a mall that she was to be his second wife. Took her into the hills above Salt Lake City, Utah. Performed some kind of mock wedding ceremony and raped her repeatedly. Told her that if she ever tried to run away, he knew where she lived. He would kill her parents, her sister. There was a time when she was hiding that she heard her uncle's voice. Part of a search party searching the hills around Salt Lake City and she could hear his voice calling her name Elizabeth. Of course, the would-be prophet had given her another name, had tried to give her a different identity. He looked at her and with his eyes communicated that if she cried out, she'd be dead. She heard that voice and she heard it fade away. So close to rescue and unable to, to cry out. There were other times when search helicopters beat so close the trees were bending in the wind. She couldn't imagine how they couldn't see her, but, but they didn't and they missed her. He would take her into town, disguised with a head wrap and a veil over her face. They would ride public transportation and eventually he got bold enough because she was brainwashed enough that she, she wouldn't run. She wouldn't run. And then there came that fateful day. She had been living like this for a long time wondering how her family was doing, knowing that they were searching for her. He, he would come back and he would see the signs posted on, on telephone poles and things that, have you seen this girl? Have you seen Elizabeth Smart? And one day out of the blue, while they were walking along the street, someone, a citizen, had spotted her and thought she was the girl matching the description and called the authorities. The authorities had been looking, of course, and they swooped down the, the patrol cars, um, um, cornered the man and, and, and her and, and his other wife, and they immediately separated the two of them together because they knew the kind of control that the man was likely to have had over her, and they got Elizabeth away. And when they got her by herself, one of the young officers looked at her and said, are you... Elizabeth Smart. And she said, I am. She knew who she was. Despite all the trauma and despite all the attempts to erase her identity, she still knew who she was. And of course, that brought her back into a sweet reunion with her, with her father and her mother and her, and, and her household. And uh, now she's a, a beautiful young woman and she's written about her story in a book. I am Elizabeth. And you know, the enemy has, has done that to us as Christians. He's tried his best to, to, to brainwash us and to keep us from knowing who we are. Do you realize what damage would be done to Satan's kingdom if we knew who we were in Christ? If we understood our authority in him, when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, now therefore go. 
Go in my authority. Go in my name. Go bearing my character. If we knew who we were, the privileges that we have as sons and daughters of God, his kingdom would be done. So it is in his best interest to keep us depressed, busy, fatigued, discouraged, doubtful. It's in his interest to keep us holding the sign. I am the body of Christ. I've been given the gift, the golden gift of the Holy Spirit. I've fallen on hard times. Please, any help you can give would be appreciated. My friends, it's time for us to rise up in the name and in the authority of Jesus Christ, to know who we are, so that when the world, our friends, our family members, our coworkers look at us, who are you? Are you Jesus Christ's? We will say, I am. You must be born again. You must be born again. A whole new nature. You see, as in Adam, all die. So in Christ shall all be made alive. You've got to get out of Adam and into Christ. <laughs> You, you, you've got to get out of Adam's bloodline and into Christ's bloodline. Christ in me is my hope of glory. Are you ready to put down your sign? Do me a favor, just before we pray. If you have something to write on, and you may not, a neighbor might have a piece of paper or a program or a tithe envelope, anything that you can write on. Do me a favor. On whatever you can find, would you write down one word that's on your sign? The sign that you hold, I, on my way to this campus two nights ago, we were just exiting the uh, Muckleshoot reservation exit and we were stopped at the bottom of the ramp and a lady who seemed to be very nicely dressed across the street in front of our car And I noticed that she had a, a piece of cardboard. You can keep playing. <laughs> she had a piece of cardboard in her hand and I, I wondered what she was about to do. And she went past our car so I could see her from the side mirror and she unfolded her sign. From my vantage point, I couldn't read what it said. But just the act of her walking to that spot and unfolding the sign made my heart sink. Because I'm thinking in my mind, what are the circumstances that bring her to that spot? We all hold signs. What's the sign that you hold? Does it say discouraged? Does it say abused? 
Does it say broken? Does it say angry? What does it say? And I'd like you to write that one word down on whatever piece of paper that you might have. I don't want you to show it to your neighbor. In fact, if you want to shield it from their, from their view, um, go ahead. This is not for anyone else's eyes. You write that down on the piece of paper, whatever it is that you hold. If you don't have a piece of paper, you know that word in your mind. Then the next thing I want you to do, once you've written that down, would you take that sign and would you hold it, not for me to see it, but would you hold it facing skyward for God to see it? Because we're going to pray for strength to put the sign down. I'd like you to stand with me as we do this. And as you stand, would you just kind of hold that, hold that up skyward? Let Jesus see the sign. You know what it is you need to let go. How the enemy has duped you and deceived you and tormented you. It's time to let it go. Heavenly Father, you see the signs pointed your direction. You know, even without us doing this little exercise, the chains that have bound us. You know the signs that we hold. You know the identity theft that has taken place. You know how the enemy has messed with our minds and our hearts so that we don't know who we are in you. And Father, I'm praying tonight that everyone holding a sign will let it go. will let it go because they are going to claim in its place the new birth. In the quietness of uh, their time on their knees with you, Father, they're going to come as Jesus said to come, not through any other way, but they're going to give you their hearts. They want to be born again. Is there anyone here tonight as we stand member or non-member, Adventist or non-Adventist, it doesn't matter. Is there anybody here who wants to be born again? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the hands and for the commitments. We don't want to be the same people, Lord. We don't want to try to be Christians without being like Christ. What's missing in Christianity, it's true, it's not information. And too often it's you. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for holding on to self and the identity that the enemy has falsely given us. Help us tonight to accept the truth of your word, the truth of what you say about us. And you say that if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. May we walk in that freedom, in that newness to life, in that newness of life without any sign other than the sign of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.